just to get started, YC is a startup accelerator. Um, every year about, um, well actually every batch, every six months, about 10,000 to 12,000 companies apply to YC. Uh, this current batch, we accepted about 200 of them. They go through a three month program. Um, we help advise them, we fund them, and uh, we help them raise additional money on demo day. Um, one of the interesting things about YC is it was created because we felt like the venture funding world was built for fundraisers, not builders. And we felt that that was incorrect. That like your ability to build an amazing PowerPoint presentation or give an amazing talk really had little to nothing to do with your ability to build a great product. Um, back in the day, in the 90s and in the 80s, it cost so much money to build a product that like the major filter um, for who should be funded was can you give a good presentation. Um, that changed in the 2000s. Suddenly building products became very simple um, and significantly easier. And so then the power shifted from business people to engineers. And YC was basically created as a product for engineers who wanted to start companies as opposed to douchebag business people. Um, I am what I'm, I'm, I'm a, a poli sci major, so I am a douchebag business person as well. Um, the second thing that YC believed is that creating a startup is extremely emotionally taxing. And it is far easier to do it with a set of peers. So we invented the model of funding companies not one by one, but in a batch. So there was a large number of people with you who basically, like, you can cry on their shoulder when everything sucks. Because one of the things people don't say about startups enough is that everything sucks all the time. Like, that is your life. Um, sorry. The cool thing about YC nowadays is that the second generation of leadership in YC, the generation that I'm a part of, were all YC founders. So we basically got to add all of the things that we wish YC provided back when we were doing it um, in your position. And so I'd love to kind of describe a couple of those things. Um, first, we have startup school. So basically all of the advice that we've ever given is in this online program that anyone can participate in for free with videos and blog posts and everything for free that you can get without even applying to YC. All of the content is available online, startupschool.org. Um, of course, you know about the accelerator. What most people don't know about is a product called Bookface. So Bookface is our internal social network for YC founders. It has about 4,000 members. Bookface has fun things like an investor database with up-to-date reviews on every single investor in the Valley, um, a directory of every single YC founder and where they work today. Because many founders, even ones who aren't successful, have gone on to become executives and have important roles in other companies. Um, it has a forum where you can ask any question about your startup and get answers from other alumni. And it has deals which are provided exclusively for YC companies. Um, things like hundreds of thousands of dollars of free credits, massive discounts on basically every product you might want to use as a founder. So um, we didn't have that when I was going through YC the first time. Way better this time. Um, after um, you do YC, the accelerator, we have a program called the Series A program. And what's cool about this is that many first time founders have never gone out and tried to raise five to $10 million. And there are a lot of best practices that if you learn, you are faster at fundraising, you can fundraise from better people, and it goes, um, you can raise more money. And so we basically run a new batch for just those companies that are ready, ready to raise a Series A, and we help them raise. Um, the companies participate in that batch, about 85% of them go on to raise Series A's. Um, the next program after that's the YC Growth Program. These are for YC companies that are anywhere between 50 to 100 people and are growing really fast and have to deal with hiring policy, hiring VPs, setting up a management team, firing VPs, figuring out how to compensate salespeople, setting up second offices, all of the boring, stupid kind of company building stuff that you do after product market fit. So what's cool about YC is that all of this stuff is under the YC kind of realm. And all of it you get if you get into YC, the early stage program, the, the accelerator. So there's no more, you don't have to give us any more equity. You don't have to give us anything else. You get all this stuff. These are all the things that we wish we had. Um, just to give you a sense of some stats, so far we've funded about 2,100 companies. 
one of the things that I joke about is that um, most of those companies are dead or in the process of dying. <laughs> Sorry. That's the reality of startups. We know a lot about what to do not to die based on seeing all those companies die. Um, figuring out how to win is often described as just figuring out how not to die long enough. In the case of Twitch, that was definitely the case. Um, there are 4,000 alumni, as I mentioned. The combined valuation of YC companies is now over $100 billion. Uh, we funded 100 companies that are worth over $100 million and 17 that are over, worth over a billion. Um, so that's YC. That's my little shtick. Now let's get into advice. First, should I be a startup founder? Um, honestly, the answer for the general population is absolutely not. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to do. Um, how many of you are considering being a startup founder? Raise your hand. Great. <laughs> Maybe you should reconsider. Um, when I look at successful YC founders, there are a couple things that really stick out. Um, the first is they have a strong desire to actually wanting to be running a startup. They see the um, end is running a startup. They don't see the end as being rich or going to cool parties with rich people or any of the things that might come if you're successful. They see the end as actually doing the startup bit. And they don't really care deep down inside. They wouldn't switch what they were doing even if they knew their startup was going to fail. Um, and let's be clear, most startup founders kind of logically think their startup's going to fail because the success rate is extremely small. So the first thing you have to ask yourself if you want to be a YC uh, startup founder, screw YC, just any kind of startup founder is, would you like to work on the problem that you're working on right now or the problem that you might want to work on or the company might want to work on for five to ten years and then have it fail? Does that sound like fun? Um, if not, this might not be for you. Google is hiring and they're over there. <laughs> um, another thing that people think about is, when am I the most motivated? There are some people who are just generally motivated. There are other people that when they're inside of another company or when they have a boss or when they're inside of something that's too structured, they're just not motivated and they don't work hard. If you're the kind of person that can work hard and really feel fulfilled at Google, you should work there. If you're the kind of person where honestly working at a big company almost makes you a little sick to your stomach, like that's when you should consider maybe this isn't for me, maybe I should be a startup founder. And I'll tell you, like the Google job is amazing. Like I hate when people shit on like non-startup jobs. Like they allow you to have a life. They allow you to have like positive relationships. You don't feel like your gonna, company's gonna die every day, right? It's like a very help, healthy place to be. Uh, they pay extremely well. Startups don't pay well. Like, these jobs are great. You have to be a little stupid and a little crazy to actually want to stick with a startup. Um, we see a lot of people at YC who think they want to do a startup, and within like 12 months, they realize it's actually not for me. Um, I think that if you want to do a startup and be successful for long term, you have to be anchored to something about that startup. Either the problem that the startup is solving or the people that you are working with. There has to be something that anchors you to this thing when it's not going well. Now for me, when we started Twitch, it started as this thing called Justin TV, which was an online reality TV show. I had no interest in an online reality TV show. Um, in fact, it's the dumbest idea you could have as a startup founder. Like None of you have, found, have ideas worse than an online reality TV show. Um, but I got to do it with my best friend in the world, Justin Kahn. And so the thing that kept me there day after day doing work that I didn't like and getting punched in the face was I got to work with my best friend. I see f a lot of founders who don't have that anchor so that when things are going, not going well, they give up. So you have to think about what's going to be the anchor. The best anchor is that you actually give a shit about the problem that you're solving. That's the best anchor. It maybe is a problem that you have or a problem your friends have or a problem that your family has or a problem in your community. A lot of people, like the kind of shtick that a lot of VCs say, are solve a personal problem. What they're really trying to tell you is there should be something in your startup that you give a shit about when it's not working because it's going to be not working all the time. 
So there should be something that you care about that's going to motivate you. The last thing is this is not a resume item or career path. If you like resumes and career paths, go work at Google. Um, I'm serious. Like, we actually see this a lot on YC applications where it's like, oh, like, I want to do a startup in my 20s because it's going to set me up for like getting a senior VP job at Dropbox in my 30s. And we're just like, thank you for telling us why we should reject you. <laughs> like, easiest application to read in the whole world. Um, this isn't about, like these types of people who make good startup founders, they don't fit into career paths. They don't fit into like neat resumes. They, they don't care about having blue chip companies on their resume. They don't think about their life as like working for someone else and working through someone else's system of hiring or raises or promotions. Like they think of actually wanting to do all that shit themselves. And so if any of that kind of feels warm and comforting, that idea of like working within someone else's system and kind of having this safety and security and free time, go work at Google. So if there are any of you left who actually want to do a startup, um, awkwardly, a lot of the advice on how you get started is completely wrong. Um, I have this saying called an MBA startup. At YC, we like to shit on MBAs. We have some MBAs who've gone through and done well, but we still like to shit on them. Um, an MBA startup, I define as a startup in an industry that you have no personal connection to or understanding of, where you think you've found some arbitrage opportunity that everyone else in that industry is stupid and hasn't seen. And when you put it in an Excel spreadsheet, it looks like it might be a billion dollar company. That is a bad place to start a company. First, you've got no personal connection. Once you feel, realize that your solution is wrong, you're not going to be excited about keeping on working on it. Second of all, the assumption that the people who in that industry are stupid is almost always wrong. Hilariously, almost always, it's you guys who are stupid. Like, almost always. And the big ass company that you're trying to disrupt is almost always the smart one. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and three, and I think like, you know, to be honest, like most importantly, um, oftentimes it's not obvious that a company can get big when it started. Um, you know, when Airbnb started, I remember when they came to, you know, hang out with us and try to get help. And I wasn't thinking, oh man, this could be the future of like, this could disrupt the hotel industry. This could be the future of how people vacation. The reason why I enjoyed working with them is they were tenacious founders. I thought the idea wasn't good. Um, you know, Ben from Pinterest, he went to school with me. I remember seeing his product early on. I remember being really, really amazed by how tenacious he was at trying to solve this problem. But I thought collecting photos on the internet was a dumb idea. Um, a lot of people thought that people streaming video games on the internet was also a dumb idea. So like the ideas usually don't sound too good when they start. And it's usually pretty hard to put them in Excel spreadsheet and like spit out billion dollar outcomes. So don't do an MBA idea. Instead, here's something to consider. Um, being in college means that you are in the place where most founders, most young founders, will find their co-founders. So don't fuck up this opportunity. Like literally your co-founders might be in the room, or they might be in your dorm, they might be in your apartment building. And if you don't get a sense of who these people might be, then you're gonna have a, a really hard time connecting with them later. Because later on, they're going to be spread across the world. But right now, they're all in one place. So the first thing I always tell people is find friends you enjoy to brainstorm with. That's step one, friends you enjoy brainstorming with. There are two type of people you can brainstorm with. Um, if I said, um, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this room was painted orange, right? If you said, no, you're an idiot. That would be a bad brainstorming partner, right? <laughs> if you said, you know, orange is a little weird, but like this room really has no color. Maybe like the background should be, the, diff the stage should be different so that when people are looking up here instead of around, right? They basically continue the conversation with you as opposed to shut down the conversation. 
You want to make sure you're identifying those types of people in your social group and you want to become more friends with them. Um, that can often happen in weird ways in college. It can happen because you plan a trip with them. It can happen because you work in a student group with them. But like you know these types of people and you know the opposite as well. You know the people that nobody likes who just shut down ideas. Um, once you have that group of people, start talking about problems that you care about, that you have a personal connection to in some way. Not solutions, not products, not ideas. Idea is kind of the scariest and worst word. Idea is a solution. And I always tell founders, start with problems. And if you're brainstorming problems, interesting problems that should be solved in the world with your friends, that is the good starting point. That is where a lot of magic can happen. As opposed to saying to your friends, here's this fully formed idea that's probably wrong. Um, what do you think about it? It's a lot easier when you're basically brainstorming with people and together you start coming up with potential solutions to the problem. The next thing is that if there is a solution that's interesting, don't put any process in front of starting to build. You don't need to incorporate, you don't need to, you literally don't need to do anything but start building. You don't need to apply to accelerators, you don't have to make a fundraising pitch deck. Start building. Figure out a simple first version that you can get out into the world and in front of customers. Now, this is a little counterintuitive because oftentimes people say the first step in startups is to do customer development, right? Well, tricky, but if the problem is one that you have or your friends have or your parents have, or your community has, you've already done customer development, right? You already know potential first customers. So it's a lot easier to start with problems that are in your community because the customer development has already begun. You, your life has been customer development. The next step is to launch your product and try to get some customers. It's like really simple. Actually try to get some of those people where you know they have the problem to try to use your product. At that moment, you'll realize your solution is completely wrong. And that's okay. You didn't spend that much time building it. You haven't incorporated, you haven't raised money, you don't have a lot of obligation. You just started. Now you should be iterating your product. You should go back to them after a week and say, look, we fixed it, is it better now? Look, we fixed it, is it better now? If you've signed up a couple users through that process who are actually using your product, now is the time that perhaps you should consider incorporating and raising money. Um, this strategy is set up so that you have the maximum amount of leverage when you go in and fundraise. Because at this point, with a launched product, with a couple customers, an investor is going to be slightly afraid of you. What most early stage founders fuck up on is they think to themselves, I need money to get started, and that puts all the leverage in my hands. If I don't give you money, you don't get your shit done. That's horrible. Now, investors love that. They love to say, yeah, just come to me with your deck, with your ideas, you don't have to have anything, right? Of course they say that, because like, that's what maximizes their leverage. They're awkwardly not exactly on your side. Awkwardly. <laughs> um, and so by making sure that you have product, that you have customers, that you have teammates that you're working with, you're basically enabling yourself to get access to higher quality investors, and you're kind of forcing them to choose whether they're gonna invest in you much faster. That almost always creates better results. And by the way, this is a trick for YC. Like, the, this is the easiest way to get into YC. Um, and it actually doesn't take it that much more time than going around and shoveling the pitch deck that nobody wants to see and spending six months raising money and failing. So that is an order of operations for starting startups. I'm not gonna say that's how every single startup started. It's clearly not. But like, when you're thinking about your path, try to figure out, like, can I fit that? And what advantages would it give me to fit a path that looks more like that and less like, giving all the leverage to investors. The next thing that we should talk about is now product market fit. Unfortunately, founders really like to lie to themselves because doing a startup is really hard. And the kind of newest and most in vogue lie is for people to say, I have product market fit. Um, YC companies do it all the time and I spend a lot of time telling them, no, you don't. 
And I know because like we invested in you and I work with you every day and I'm telling you, you don't. Um, very weird thing because if you don't know whether you have it, you absolutely don't have it. Um, what I find funny is that a huge percentage of YC founders basically are getting punched in the face every day because they don't have product market fit. But every once in a while, someone will come to me and they'll say, Michael, everything is blowing up. Like everything all at the same time. Like we're making more money than we thought, but like all of our employees hate us. Our customers are hating us, but they're using our product more than we ever thought. Like we need to hire everyone, but we don't have any time to do it. Everything's breaking and everything is working. And they say, you didn't tell me that it sucked when things go well. And I say, shit, I'm sorry. It sucks when things go well. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's, that's the game. Product market fit feels like that overwhelming, things are going overwhelmingly well. Like so well, you're mad at it. Think about how good that has to be for you to be angry that your startup is growing, right? That's how good. If you don't feel that angry, you don't have product market fit. And so what's interesting about product market fit is that the vast majority of companies never hit it. And it's not correlated with fundraising. You would be surprised. Um, we've done an analysis on YC companies that raised five to ten million dollars and died. You know what the biggest cause of death? No product market fit. So like fundraising is not equivalent to it. Just having users isn't equivalent to it, right? It has to be everything breaking all at the same time and you feel horrible about it. That's really the line. So interestingly enough, I really have to reset founders mindset and I have to really work with them and say, look, I hope that you have a really strong understanding of the customer and of the problem but you probably don't have any understanding of the solution that should be built to solve this problem. Most of the early phase of your company is going to be running experiments on the solution. So don't fall in love with your product in the early stage because it's going to change a lot. Typically the entire time before you raise a series A, which for most company means the entire time they're in existence, is spent experimenting on their solution and holding their customer and their problem constant. And the cool thing about doing this is that every experiment you learn, if you hold those two things constant, the customer and the problem, um, we call this process iteration. Now, iteration is nowhere near as popular a word as pivot. Pivot is a really shitty, horrible thing that somehow has become very popular nowadays, but it's just the sign of absolute failure repeated. Sorry, if any of you are pivoting, I apologize. Um, when you pivot, most typically you hold the solution constant and you change the problem or the customer. And the typical way it goes is, my solution is this beautiful butterfly angel that of course is perfect. It's just that it's the wrong customer. So I should just change the customer or change the problem until I find a customer and problem worthy of my unique butterfly amazing solution. Right? That's usually wrong. Almost always wrong. Um, so, changing the customer and the problem, I advise you do that only if you've been working for, on something for two years. I advise you pivot only if you're working on something for two years. Because, like, it's hard to figure out what people want. Even if you know their problem and you know who they are. Give yourself some fucking time. Right? This shit isn't easy. If it was easy, the big companies would be nailing it. So if you don't give yourself enough time to iterate solutions and find what your customers want, what will happen and what often happen is you pivot to some other customer and problem, someone else serves that customer, that old customer and problem, and they build a billion dollar company and you say, shit, I should have kept on working on that thing I was working on. That happens in YC all the time because it's actually problems and customers are pretty easy to understand. They're not easy to build solutions for, but it's pretty easy to understand when someone's desperate for something. And so like oftentimes you see companies come right after you, they kept with it and bam, you're not happy and those founders are really happy. So um, 
in this process, the number one thing to do is not lie to yourself. The number one thing to do is not make yourself feel good by lying to yourself. That's why it's nice to have teammates that you actually enjoy working with. That's why it's nice to have a problem you actually enjoy working on. So you don't have to lie to yourself to say your solution is better than it is. Um, great solutions almost never have to be actually sold in the early days. When we talk to startups about sales, oftentimes we say sales in the early days is about telling as many people in your customer set about the problem and waiting for them to come screaming to you saying, oh my God, I have this problem so much. I'm willing to use your shitty half broken thing because my life is fucking like ending. Like that's what sales feels like in early stage. If you find yourself trying to convince someone that they have the problem, you're doing it wrong. If you find yourself trying to do something that feels like traditional selling, you're doing it wrong. In the early stage, it's about filtering and trying to find the people who are so desperate that they use your crazy thing. The next thing is don't cargo cult success. This is a huge problem among startups and YC startups. Um, somehow, without product market fit, it's actually not that hard to raise money, especially if you're technical in the Bay Area. So you raise a million or $2 million and you think to yourself, well, if these smart investors gave me money, maybe I have product market fit. So then you're like, well, what do companies with product market fit do? They start hiring. They get an office. They start doing all hands meetings. They start speaking at conferences. They start writing like fancy thought leader blog posts, right? <laughs> Holy shit, you can spend that $2 million in about a year and a half. You wake up, you don't have product market fit. No investor is gonna give you a five, $10 million check. Your company dies. This happens all the time with YC companies. So it happens even more for non-YC companies. This is a very common path, cargo culting success. Successful companies are hiring new employees every week. Well, we should be hiring new employees every week. It's like, no. Be honest with yourself. Understand whether you have success or not. If you don't have success, your mindset should be Navy SEALs. Small, interdisciplinary team with not tons of deep experience in any one area. That's your mindset. A team that doesn't require active management. A team where if someone goes away, another person can take over the role. Non-specialization. No more than six people, no more than eight people. Like that range is the kind of optimal range. Now people always think if we hired more people, we move faster. It turns out that above six to eight people, you move slower as you hire more people because you have to introduce management. So now the founders, which typically some of the most talented people on the team, are spending time managing and they're not spending their time talking to customers and building. The sad part of this, that uh, part of my job, is that often I have to talk to these companies and I have to tell them that they have to lay off all those people they hired. And that really sucks. And the reason why they have to do that is because they basically bulked up their org, so now they can't actually figure out the solution anymore because they're too busy trying to help people figure out their career development paths and running hiring processes and doing all these things that only post-product market fit companies should be doing. So, as I said before, um, failure sucks. I often say most startup founders start out in the shit, but that sucks. Once you get out of that shit, unfortunately it still sucks. And so let's be clear, like if you don't, if you're not doing the thing you really enjoy doing, if you don't really want to be doing a startup, if you don't really want to be working with this other person, if you don't really want to be working on this problem, you're not going to survive all the pain. Plain and simple, you're not going to survive all the pain. So there we go. That's my happy-go-lucky talk about startups. I apologize, it wasn't extremely inspiring. To end, if I still have a little time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I want to tell some fun stories about almost dying, but not. Um, OK. So the first one, um, the first one is kind of a classic one about my co-founder, Kyle. So Kyle Vogt, um, who's now the CEO of Cruise and you know, sold Cruise to GM for a billion dollars and is making self-driving cars. Back in the day, he was co-founder at Justice TV Twitch and he was the head of our video system. Um, whenever our video system went down, it was Kyle's job to bring it back up. So we're all living in an apartment together, all four founders. It's Saturday, 
and video is down. Um, Kyle, unfortunately, is in Tahoe um, taking a break. Emmett, my other co-founder, who's um, still running Twitch to this day, is an amazing engineer, but it doesn't know anything about the video system. So basically, he's sitting there slamming on his keyboard and looks up every minute at me and says, get Kyle right now. Because everything is down, and we have about 35 million people who come to our site, and they're seeing no video. Um, also, I'm not technical, so I can't do shit about this. So <laughs> my job is to find Kyle, right? <laughs> of course, bedroom, not there. Cell phone, he's not picking up. Now I'm like, OK, this is tricky, right? So I call one of his friends, and I find out that he is actually at this address in this house in Tahoe. But I think to myself, Tahoe is like six, eight hours away. How the fuck do I get him a message if he's not picking up his phone or his email or anything? So um, finally, what dawns on me is pizza. There's pizza everywhere, right? <laughs> so I call up a pizzeria in Tahoe. And I say, all right, here's the deal. I need to send one of your guys, <laughs> knock on the door, and say, the website's down. Because I figured that was like the easiest thing, right? And the guy who picks up the phone is like, let me get my manager. <laughs> and I'm like, shit. <laughs> and like, this is like minutes surpass it. Like, this is bad, right? Manager gets the phone. What do you want? What kind of pizza do you want? It's like, all right, here's the deal. And you send a driver to this address, tell the person the website's down. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? So like two minutes later, he kind of gets it. And he's like, but in order to send a driver out, we need to put a pizza into the system. <laughs> so what pizza do you want? I'm like, I don't get cheese pizza, whatever, right? And he's like, unfortunately, cheese pizza is below our delivery minimum. <laughs> like, minutes are passing, right? Like horrible. So I'm just screaming at him. I'm like, extra cheese, pepperoni, I don't care, right? <laughs> so give him the credit card, the guy goes. Pulls up in one of those like, you know, cars with a pizza top in front of Kyle's house, and he walks up. Um, Kyle sees it, comes to the door, and the, the driver's like, I don't know if this means anything to you, <laughs> but the website's down. <laughs> <laughs> and Kyle's like, fuck, OK. And then Kyle's like, is there a pizza? And the guy's like, no pizza. <laughs> so. Um, one example of getting punched in the face constantly. Um, here's another example. So before we did Twitch, we had this site called Justin TV. And Justin TV let anyone broadcast any video online 24-7. Um, and about 20% of our traffic was gamers. At the time, we didn't realize that could be a huge thing. And about 20% of our traffic was people just streaming their own stuff, like whatever, from their room. And about 60% of our traffic was people streaming illegal content. Movies, video games, Premier League soccer. We literally had the Super Bowl on Justin TV illegally. And so during the Super Bowl, when it's like, this can't be reproduced, rebroadcast, da 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 da, I watched that on my website. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't good. So, right before the Beijing Olympics, um, NBC is getting a little worried about where the content's going to appear online. So um, the Olympics start up, I think, on Wednesday. The Friday before, NBC hires a lawyer, a law firm actually, and they call us. They call me on my cell phone and they say, look, the Olympics are starting next week. We think they're going to be on your website. We don't like your website. So on Monday, we're going to go to the courtroom in San Francisco and the judge is going to shut your website down permanently. And we're like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> and they're like, this is just informational. Like, this is what's going to happen. We're just calling you to let you know. <laughs> I'm just like, Fuck, OK. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I still am and asking. And they're just like, yeah, no, like, it's not going to be temporary shutdown. It's going to just, it's going to be off the internet, like forever. Um, or like, it's going to be off the internet until you pay like millions of dollars of legal fees to like fix it. And so I said, OK, um, 
Is there anything that we could potentially do to perhaps make it so that you don't, you know, shut our business off on Monday? And the lady's like, no, there isn't. Um, it would just be impossible for you to do what you would have to do. And I said, well, you just try us, right? I mean, worst case scenario, we can't do it. Just what, what could we do? And she said, well, you'd have to build a whole separate site that would allow our team of content moderators to live monitor every single stream on your website and one click shut down any stream that had the Olympics content. And I thought to myself, we could do that. That's not that hard. <laughs> no one ever asked us in quite this way <laughs> um, and threatened us quite like you have. Um, <laughs> We are fairly motivated. <laughs> so she said, well, you'd have to have this by Monday morning. And I was like, I think I'm, we'll hit that date. Don't worry. So I go back to the team. I'm like, well, we're not doing anything this weekend. We have to build, you know, Uber content mentoration thing in like 24 hours. Um, we built the whole thing. We hand it to the lady Monday morning. She looks at it. She tries it out. She's like, all right, we're good. And company alive. And so literally, that kind of shit can happen completely outside of your control. And um, let me say that was not fun. Um, I've got one more, and I'll then take questions. Um, so uh, kind of one of the most tricky parts about Twitch and Justin TV um, was in 2010. So in 2010, we had gotten... Um, we had raised, I don't know, maybe about eight, nine million dollars, but we were running low on money. And it became clear every month that investors did not want to invest in our website. They didn't like live video. They didn't like copyright content. They didn't like our bandwidth bills. Um, they thought we sucked as people. So they weren't going to give us any money. And in about August 2010, um, things got bad. We had about half a million dollars in the bank and we were burning about $250,000 a month. So it was like, okay, things are about to be very, very bad. And we probably had about 50 employees. Um, at the time, we were making about $750,000 a month. We were spending about a million dollars a month to run the site. So we got together all the senior people at Justin TV. It was about 12 people. And we had this really shitty conference room that was just like this, like basically like walk-in closet. We all pile in the closet. We have a whiteboard. And I'm saying, OK, here's, this is the math. We either have to, we're either going to get to within 100K of break even and have five months of runway. We're going to hit break even and survive. Or we're going to get profitable and never have to fundraise again outside of our control, outside of our plan. And I didn't know what my teammates were going to say they wanted to do. And they all said, OK, we're going to get profitable. And I was like, OK, well, we need to figure out how to either make $250,000 more a month or not spend $250,000 more a month. And actually, we probably need to figure out both. So we sat down in that room for four hours. And on one side of the whiteboard, we wrote down everything we could do to make more money. Um, Pre-roll video ads, adding ads everywhere. Um, charging international users a subscription, like Netflix. There are all kinds of things. And then we did all the things we could do to cut costs, you know, optimizing our video server usage, optimizing bandwidth usage, all kinds of things. And then we got to work. And what was interesting is because we were transparent with all of our employees about exactly where we were at, exactly how fucked we were, instead of people quitting, they all gathered together and they all chipped in. And we told everyone, look, if we somehow figure out how to end this year with $100,000 of profit. We'll take the whole company to Hawaii. And everyone was just like, that's not going to happen. But you know, great goal. Good, you know, good management, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we all got to work. And we had two things that were in our favor. One, everyone worked really hard. And two, um, as many people know, for advertising businesses, the fourth quarter is always the best month in the year. So we built all kinds of things. We did all this work. And we got profitable in October 2010, and we ended the year with a million dollars in profit. And so we took everyone to Hawaii the following March. Um, during that time, we sat down and we said, we're not going to be satisfied with just this level of profit. 
we need to figure out how to make this site something huge, not just something that's alive. And we came up with two ideas on how to do that. One of them is called Twitch. And from that kind of death, almost death, that's when we started figuring out maybe these video gamers are the play. Um, if you look at the story of Justin TV and Twitch, it's an eight year story. From the beginning to year six, we went from being worth zero to being worth 24 million. From the last two years, we went from 24 million to almost a billion dollars in value when we sold. So when you think about what it takes to get this done, six years of getting punched in the face and almost dying, and then we figured something out. So that's the kind of journey that is extremely typical. That's unfortunately the story that is not told in the press about how this all happens, but that's kind of how it happens. And so if you're willing to kind of take that journey, sometimes you find a twitch at the end of it. Sometimes you don't. Anyways, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any questions? Uh, um, so we're going to open up questions. Uh, uh, yeah. So we're going to start off here. So for students who are in this class, they will ask, ask questions first, and then we'll move on. So you talked about how uh, your process is just in and you can switch, uh, and take a lot of years. Uh, so but there is also something in it to uh, you know, take down the company to shorten the target. I mean, is that also true now? <coughs> I mean, you guys just saw Brex, right? Okay. I, would say, um, I would say this. There are all different paths to becoming a successful company. And interestingly enough, nowadays, there's so much money around that it's actually, you start seeing paths where companies raise a lot of money and get really, really high valuations. But like they are still basically early stage companies. And so you really can't be fooled by the billion dollar valuation. Like I love Brex. I'm a shareholder. I love the billion dollar valuation. But like their goal is to kill Amex. And they're nowhere close to killing Amex. It's just the very, very beginning. And so, you know, that's why you have to be very careful about this game because, like, sometimes investors get really excited, but killing MX doesn't take two years. Uh, it takes nobody two years to kill MX. It's going to be a long journey. Good? You mentioned um, that if you, if you just don't have customers beating down your door, then you, you just don't have product market fit. Yeah. What successful strategies have you seen for people not to not die who have, like, a couple of months to figure out how to get to that point? The best way to not die as a startup is to stop spending money. The biggest way that startups spend money is on people, almost always. So like the sad and awkward truth is that letting go of people is usually the thing that people do to give themselves more time. And that's why I talk about this so much. If you didn't hire those people, you wouldn't have to let them go. And you wouldn't have to put them through this horrible experience. So um, that's a big one. The other one is charging. Um, there are a lot of companies that get to you know, ramen profitable, that get to break even on a small amount of revenue, and then they have time to figure things out. In a weird way, that's what Justin TV and Twitch did. I mean, we were, prof we were you know, at eight to $10 million of profit when we were doing it. But basically, like, being just a little bit profitable, even $10 profitable, gives you time to figure things out. So those are like the two best ways to give yourself time. Um, strangely, raising a lot of money is not a great way. Um, oftentimes, your investors kind of expect you to spend the money in a way that lines up with being a post-product market fit company. Um, so, you know, raising $5 million and saying, oh, well, that'll give us enough time to figure it out. Oftentimes, you find yourself spending that $5 million really fast and not figuring things out. Let's do the first one first. So what was the problem with Justin TV? So this is something I've been thinking about a lot, right? Because like, how does the Justin TV story fit the narrative? So I'd say is that like, the thing that was my anchor was Justin. Um, that was very clear. 
And then I became really good friends with other two co-founders. And my anchor was making sure that our thing didn't die so that I could continue working with them and that they would continue being able to do the company. Justin's thing was actually really simple. He wanted to be famous. <laughs> that was his problem. How do I become famous? And he never really put it that way. But like, <laughs> you don't name something Justin TV and make an online reality TV show <laughs> if you don't want to be famous. So that was his problem. And like, by the way, like, you know, you would argue maybe a stupid problem, but you know, Twitch is making people famous every day. I think that we changed the customer once. The customer switched from Justin, who was wearing a camera on his head, to the person online who wanted to be famous. Um, but honestly, like, the customer didn't change with Twitch. They were gamers on Justin TV very, very early. We ignored them, but they were always there. Um, and so, you know, we were solving the same problem. How do you become famous? Weirdly, like, even more so, how can you become famous enough to make enough money that you can just do the thing that's making you famous and not have a day job? Like, that problem kind of stayed constant, and the customer changed once. And the customer changed within the first year and then didn't change again for seven years. Yeah. Come back afterwards for the second question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what do you do if you want to be a startup founder and you're not a software engineer? Um, step one is become friends with software engineers. <laughs> Honest but true. There are a lot of people who try to go the outsourced engineering route and they almost always do two things. Spend a lot of, well, three things. Spend a lot of money, get shitty products, and go to business. So I don't advise that path. Um, I think one of the interesting things about not being too caught up in solutions is it basically allows you to find other teammates with complementary skills and then brainstorm solutions together. And so that's why I always tell people to start talking with problems. So one, be in college, you got that. There are a bunch of technical people. How many people can write code in this room? Raise your hand. Boom. They're hiding because they're not sure if they want to work with you. <laughs> but they're there. And two, like brainstorm interesting problems with them. Um, once you're starting a company, there's a shit ton of things to do. The way that I kind of joined up with Justin, actually, was that we were taking this road trip around the comp across the country when they were, Justin and them were going to start Justin TV. I was just on vacation with them. And when we got to San Francisco, like, they had this $50,000 check from Paul Graham, founder of YC, and like, they were sleeping in like, the basement of Justin's cousin's apartment in like, Mountain View. And I was like, well, this is horrible. Like, why don't we find you guys a bank account to put the money in instead of a check in your wallet? And why don't we find an apartment that you guys can live in so you're not living in a basement? And at the end of like, a week, I had done that for them as kind of a gift because you know, they're my friends. And then like, on the way back to the airport to fly home, Justin's like, why don't you be a co-founder? Because like, we don't like doing the things like setting up bank accounts and finding apartments. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you guys are really bad at those things. <laughs> Um, you know, after we launched, it was customer service, it was press, it was fundraising. There were all kinds of other things. Um, there's a lot to do in a company. Good. So a lot of the advice you gave, I think, is geared towards like software because you know the tools are really easy. But then, so I'm working on a hardware thing. And yeah, you're yeah. fucked, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. I have no money. How do I test? So this is what's so fun about hardware, right? Like. If you're trying to do a startup, you're signing up for just like death, right? It's like basically assured death. And now a, a, a software startup. If you're trying to do a hardware startup, welcome to it's 10 times harder. You chose that. I didn't choose that. I would never tell anyone to do a hardware startup. It's fucking basically impossible. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you a horrible story to make it worse, right? So one of my... <laughs> One of my partners, um, this guy named Eric, he was the founder of Pebble. Pebble was like the world's first smartwatch. Um, Pebble raised like over, a million, over $10 million on Kickstarter, like was doing amazing. He has sold a quarter billion dollars worth of start smartwatches. But in their last year of operation, they misestimated how much sales they were going to do for the year. 
They thought they were going to do $100 million in sales, and we did $82 million in sales. That gap of $18 million killed their company. Dead. Fuck, right? On $88 million of revenue, dead. So um, know that you're signing up for something ridiculously hard, and just be cool with it. And like, what's the solution? I don't know. Like, you're definitely fucked, but like, <laughs> If you enjoy what you're working on, right, there are startups that do hardware that succeed. Don't get me wrong, right? Cruise is effectively a hardware startup and it succeeds. But like, it becomes even more important that like, this is kind of your life's work. Like, you really give a shit. Like, if you think it's just going to be kind of a good business, like, trust me, it's not going to be a good business. It's not, it's not going to be easy. It's, it's not going to be simple. So like, if you have a choice, choose software. If you don't have a choice, just, man, you better fucking love it. Um, and then good luck because it's hard as shit. And we still fund hardware companies, don't get me wrong, but like they almost all die. <laughs> but the software ones die too, so it's fine. Good? Hey Michael, Chris, our team is working on the problem of discovering relevant content, articles, and videos. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the elements of what we're building are competitive, right? Yeah. How do you put on your CEO hat to think about accepting teams that are competitive with your existing Kill Steve, teams? I hate Steve. Right. I mean, Steve's a great friend of mine, I don't hate Steve. But like, one of the funny things that YC does is we fund competitors all day long, all day long. In fact, when I went back through YC a second time, I was doing Social Cam, which was this um, video app for the phone. I was a direct competitor in my batch. And like, what's funny is that like, competitors almost never kill you. Like, usually what kills you is you don't have product market fit and you die, right? Well, usually what kills the competitors is they don't have product market fit and they also die. <laughs> um, it's rare that like two companies get product market fit and fight each other out. It happens, Lyft, Uber, Gusto Zenefits, but it's pretty rare. Um, so oftentimes when a YC company comes in for interviews that's competing with, or the company comes in interviews competing with the YC company, my first question is like, how are you going to fucking kill them? And like, maybe you will, right? Steve better be on his game. He knows it's a hard game. So yeah. Thanks. Cut. Uh, when you joined Justin TV, they were already incorporated, and if they were, did you get share and yes. So when I, when I joined Justin TV, it was already incorporated. It had been incorporated about two months before. Um, they basically issued new shares. All of, the found, all of the kind of shares were vesting. All four-year vesting, one-year cliff. So, yeah. 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 That's standard, by the way. In the orange. Yeah. You want, yeah. So, um, were there any moments where we got into fights and I maybe was no longer friends with my co-founders, but I still wanted to do my startup? Yes, there was a second and more unhealthy anchoring in my startup. It was the only thing I had done after graduation. So my entire ego and self-worth was inside of this company. If this company failed, my life grade would have been an F. This is not healthy. Uh, startups aren't that healthy. But that was the other thing at the extreme base level was just like, oh wow, I'm six years in. Do I want a life grade of an F? No? Keep this fucking thing alive. Yeah, kind of tricky. You had one? How much money should a startup spend on marketing? This is extremely variable on the startup. What I will say is this, like one thing that we kind of see is people overemphasizing Facebook ads or advertising in general. What I'll tell you is that like most startups find differentiated ways to get customers. And Facebook ads are really not a differentiated way. The problem with Facebook ads is that they're, Facebook is really good at pricing them to perfection. They're really, really good at saying, oh, like this customer is worth $5 for you. We're going to charge you $4.99 to get access to them. That's their business is to squeeze that. And what's funny is they get better every single year. So Facebook ad rates go up every single year. And like we're not making that many new people in the United States. And so basically every year, shit's more expensive. So like be careful about spending money on marketing. Oftentimes marketing, spending money on marketing is something that you do to accelerate growth versus create growth. Now, in the extreme early days, when you just want to have some people 
floating through. Sometimes it makes sense to spend on advertising. Um, and there are, certain, there are certain businesses where this is different, but that's the general advice, yeah. Uh, and the red. Yeah, usually it's just not big of a deal. Honestly, if they're not using the work computer and they're working nights and weekends not in their office, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if they want a little bit more protection, they can actually go to their company and they can do um, th th what's called an IP assignment agreement where they can actually like tell their company, hey, here's some side projects I'm working on that I want to own. But it's not that big of a deal. There's one right behind you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks. Oh, that's a great question. So working at YC is actually weird. Um, working at YC is basically community service, um, which sounds weird. <laughs> um, but like I made a bunch of money, right? So like I don't really need to make more money. In fact, I have this extremely strong feeling now that I know a lot of rich people that making more money is going to make my life worse and like fuck my kids up completely. <laughs> so I'm not really that interested in making much more money. And but what I feel about the startup community, and especially the startup community in the Bay Area, is that like people believed in us when they shouldn't have. And people helped us when they shouldn't have. And like I'm from the East Coast originally. And like on the East Coast, people give back by like giving money to charity and going to balls. But when like someone actually needs help who's like younger than them and maybe in their industry, oftentimes they don't help them. Um, oftentimes because they fear that they're going to disrupt them or because they're stuck in some corporate setup. Um, whereas on the West Coast, especially in the Bay Area, it's very different. Like people help each other, especially people in the startup community. They just kind of help each other because they're continuing this like giving back thing because someone helped them. And so I got really lucky making money here. Like I, as I told you, Twitch wasn't our first idea. And so for me, YC is amazing because I get to give back and to the community that gave me a lot. And like one day I'll make money, but it takes when you start investing in companies like close to day one, it takes a really long time to make any money off of them. So um, that's why I do it. Why did I do a startup? I mean, I said a couple of things. I think another one of the things that was interesting to me was that school wasn't very motivational. Um, I went to a fairly good high school and I had to work really hard um, to do well and to be kind of in the the group of the top 50 kids in the school. And when I got to Yale, I was like, this isn't harder than my high school. <laughs> um, and that was really disappointing. Like one, because my high school was a public school and Yale cost fuck tons of money. And <laughs> two, because like, you know, I was like a poli-sci major and so it was just like, I'm sorry for any poli-sci majors in here, but this shit ain't that hard. And so, <laughs> Sorry. And so like I started realizing, wow, like that was the first time I realized, oh, I'm inside of this system where everyone around me is motivated to kind of run like a rat. And I'm like, what, what are we, where's the motivation? Like the people aren't smarter. The classes aren't that great. Like what's going on? And what got me, uh, weirdly, were student activities. And the only reason why was because, you know, they were purely relying on the student to succeed. And so like that was motivational. It's like, oh, they're real, like, you know, at Yale, there's like, you know, the lowest grade you can get is a B minus. Like that's, we joke, it's like B minus. Like, and it's funny because at Yale, like we'll be like, oh yeah, that sucked, it completely failed, B minus, you know? Um, <laughs> it's a different place, trust me. <laughs> and so like, but in, in a student group, there were finally stakes. There was something to lose. You could win and you could lose. It wasn't safe. And I kind of realized that the only time that I really get up for something and really bring my A game is when like something's on the line. And when it's too safe, I just, I'm not motivated. And so I found that constantly in my startup where it was like, wow, like you're getting punched in the face. You're almost going to die. And they'd be like, all right, the game's on. Like, let's get this shit done, right? Like now I'm motivated, you know? Before, I was like, oh, ha, ha, whatever, like good grades, bad grades. But now it's like, oh, 50 of your employees are going to be out of work 
if you don't fucking nail this thing. And now it's like, OK, let's get it done. So that was for me. Uh, right here. I will tell you about a company today. Um, so long story short, luck is a massive factor. And anyone who tells you it's not a factor is just stupid. Um, there is a company going through YC, uh, that went through YC, sorry, that um, has done pretty good, but running low on money. And unfortunately, the founders are horrible fundraisers. And they pitched about, I don't know, 25 or 30 VCs. And they all said no. And so it was looking like within the next six months, they'd have to shut down. They had one more VC that they could pitch. And so they pitched them, and the VC seemed like they were interested. And so they got super excited. Um, the VCs did some reference calls with us, some reference calls with customers. They seemed like they are really interested. It was time for a partnership meeting. This is like the meeting before the, the, the VC decides whether to invest or not. The founders go into the partnership meeting to present to the whole partnership, and they shit the bed. And the partnership's like, this company sucks. And the partner who wants to do the deal is like, fuck, what do I do? Um, the partner who wants to do the deal likes the company so much that despite the fact that they shit the bed on the pitch, and there are all kinds of things that are wrong with the company, he said, screw it. And he's offering them a term sheet today. And he doesn't have to. And he knows he doesn't have to. And he knows that like, without that term sheet, the company's dead. And that company's going to keep on going. So yeah, luck is fucking huge. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll tell you another story like that. So our Series A back in the day, Series A's used to be a lot smaller. They're going to raise like $8 million. Our Series A was $2 million. Um, we had pitched everyone this live reality TV show. You can imagine investors were like, why the fuck would we give you money for this? <laughs> so we pitched probably like 50 VCs. And um, everyone said no. And I remember that we wrote up on our whiteboard in our apartment, which was also our office, the offers that we thought we were going to get from VCs. But we didn't get them. So there were like three offers that we were like, oh, yeah, these guys are definitely going to write us a check. And we wrote them down. It's like, you know, these guys for this much, these guys for this much. And then like, you know, a month passed and they don't give us any money. But we just forgot to erase them. Then um, we met one investor who kind of didn't have a good name and we didn't really know them that well. But we we're like, hey, we need money. So they want to come see our office, our apartment. So they come by and they see what looks like three offers <laughs> on the whiteboard. We didn't know. Like, we weren't even like, we, like, this is just whiteboards have shit on them all over, right? We had whiteboards all over the whole fucking apartment. We weren't even paying attention. And so they start getting really excited. And we're like, why are they excited? Like, we're, <laughs> like, we're not that good of a company. And, and then we realized, like, hmm, something's up, right? So then they offer us a term sheet. And we're like, they seem so excited. Maybe we can get a better offer. So we're like, hey, we'll do it, but for like a little bit more valuation. And the VC's like, yes. And we're like, yes. <laughs> and so we get the deal done, and only after the deal gets done do we, we're, we're walking around like cleaning up the apartment, and we look at this whiteboard, and we're like, oh, shit. Like, that's why they gave us this offer, because like, they saw that shit up there. That's really luck, like super luck. <laughs> we were definitely going to be dead if that didn't happen. So yeah, I, I might look like a smart guy, but like, shit, have the right stuff on the whiteboard? That's basically impossible luck. Yep. Yes. Like, I'm now pushing the like low coming college and uh, I'm not yeah, I was I was born in China, so like I don't really know many people. Do you know people in China? Huh? <laughs> Do you know people in China? Yeah, yeah, that I know. But mm. <laughs> 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 I mean maybe that's good for quite a while, well, so Okay. I mean so typically when people ask about finding co founders, um, the first thing I say is Make a list of the five people who have complementary skills that you really enjoy brainstorming with, 
who you think would be amazing co-founders, regardless of where they work or what they're doing with their life. Because oftentimes founders way overestimate how much their friends like their jobs. I see this all the time. It's like, oh, well, this person's at Google. They're never going to quit. Like, most people hate Google. So, like, they might quit. <laughs> um, make a list of those five people and then force each one of them to say no. Like, sometimes founders talk themselves out of finding co-founders before they even fucking ask the co-founder. The other thing is make them a real offer. Don't make some like, hey, do you want to work together? Maybe you can be my contractor, blah, blah, blah. Be like, hey, let's do this. I want to give you 50% of this company. Let's try to make this happen. If that doesn't work, go get a job with really smart people and make new friends. If it takes 10 to 15 years plus to make an amazing startup, sometimes you need to take a one to two year detour to build up the friendships that you need to find a co-founder. And like, that's often okay. It's often okay to take that little gap. Or go back to China, hit up your friends. China's an amazing place to create a startup. And go to town. Uh, good. Uh, you mentioned Series A startups. Um, you know, uh, I've been forgetting the market that products, you know, like uh, hiring people and stuff. But where are the signs? Uh, and then I assume that these startups, uh, since they made the Series A, they had some clients, like C4 and sure. scalable clients. Sure. Where are for you the signs, you know, you actually have the market fit? Because you have clients and, you know. I said that, right? You're breaking with success. Like, I'm going to be really, really clear, right? Like, there's like, you have some customers, there's growing, there's growing fast, and there's success is painful, right? Like the success is painful mark is typically the mark where you have product market fit. Interestingly enough, like when you hit the success is painful mark, like another way that you can tell is like, usually you're not really, for software companies specifically, usually you don't really have to be worried about scaling in the early days. Um, as your thing grows, scaling becomes more and more of a problem. Maintenance, just keeping your current shit up becomes more and more of a priority as opposed to building new features. And so there's this point where suddenly you're like, fuck new features. We need to just keep this thing alive. And like, that's also a good moment where you realize, okay, there's something here. Um, In the early days of Justin TV, how do we measure retention? Short answer, we didn't. We were stupid. Um, you have to remember that when we started Justin TV, like modern analytics was just coming about. Like most people were using Google Analytics, which is a fucking horrible product. Um, and like Mixpanel and Heap and Amplitude and all the kind of modern analytics platforms, YC hadn't funded them yet. They didn't exist. <laughs> um, the best companies at that time had to build internal analytics products like Google and Facebook. They had to build internal analytics products to that work. So yeah, we were horrible at measuring retention early. Um, we, even after Mixpanel came out, we were still bad because we didn't believe in metrics-driven development, which was stupid. So you know, later on, we used Mixpanel, and it was great. Uh, probably last two questions. Great. Over here. A startup doing what? Yeah, what do you think about startup patenting their ideas? Startup patenting, yes. This is a common question. So if you're doing a pharmaceutical company or a truly unique hardware company, then patents are typically important post raising a seed round, post raising that one to two million dollars. Um, rare that they're important in any other circumstance. Um, the one thing you have to ask about your patents in other circumstances is do you have enough money to defend them? They're not worth much if you don't have enough money to defend them. Last question. What do we got here? Right there. What are your thoughts on starting a startup outside of Silicon Valley and even in a small country in Europe? Outside? Which country? I Oof. So 40% um, of the companies in YC are international, and 60% of the founders in YC are not born in the United States. Um, I definitely think it's possible to start companies not in the United States. Big however, 
the vast majority of the billion dollar startups are founded in two places, San Francisco and Beijing. And unfortunately, a lot of startup communities around the world are very good at gathering early stage founders and giving them a community, but are not honest about how viable it is to build billion dollar companies where they are. Um, a lot of people who kind of endorse these startup communities are kind of more pro the community than they are the founder and the startup. So you kind of have to be careful. Um, in a situation where you're almost assured to die, how much location risk do you want to have? So that's something that I'd be thinking about. What I've noticed about the Valley that's different, everyone talks about the competition for engineers here. And I always laugh, right? Because it's like, imagine you're starting your company in Tampa Bay, Florida. Well, there's lower competition for engineers, but there are many fucking fewer engineers, right? <laughs> the people you want to hire aren't there, <laughs> but you don't have any, so no hooray. Um, I think the weird thing about the big technology companies in the Bay Area is that they're magnets for the best engineers in the world. And some percentage of those engineers are not going to want to work at Google and Apple and Facebook because those places suck. And they're going to want to work at startups, and you're going to be able to pick them up. In addition, as your company is growing and scaling, you have to hire more and more experienced people. And unfortunately, the level of experience that people have outside of the Bay Area, Bay Area is less. The way that this translates to a startup founder that they don't really see is, Let's say that you're doing a B2B startup and you have to hire a VP of sales. Well, if you're located in San Francisco, there might be 50 or 75 candidates that are qualified to be a VP of sales for your company. If you're located in New York, there might be 10. If you're located in Atlanta, there might be three. That's harder. There becomes a point where oftentimes it's none. And you have to import, and you're, if you're not in the Bay Area, oftentimes there are no qualified candidates and you, in, locally, and you have to import candidates. So weirdly, in the early days of a startup, you don't feel these things, right? You can get the first couple engineers, you get the designers, that are, you can get that kind of initial team going. But post-product market fit, this is where the challenges start happening. And this is where like, you would love to overpay for this specialist that doesn't exist where you are, but does exist here. So those are the pros and cons. We have lots of founders that just value being locally, and it's extremely important. For example, we founded a company called Paystack that does Stripe for Nigeria, payment processing for Nigeria and hopefully Western Africa and then all Sub-Saharan Africa. They have to be located in Lagos. Like that is where their market is. That's where all their customers are. And so that's where they are. There are all kinds of problems being in Lagos, talent problems, infrastructure problems, so on and so forth. Um, there's no money available. So they raise their money out here. They get a lot of their advice out here. They're probably gonna have to open up an office out here, but they have to be local. So what I would say is that like, when you're trying to figure out where to locate your startup, you have to ask yourself, like, how is this going to be the best for my business? Like, I would kind of take out preferences here, personal preferences. Like, you're going to have to be sacrificing personal preferences in your startups constantly. And you should be asking yourself, you know, why is Iceland the best place to build my business? Not now, but also five years from now and 10 years from now as it scales. And if it is, if it makes sense, then great, do it. And then know that there are going to be issues and prepare yourself for solving them. If it's not, then like, don't do it because you like Iceland. Like, maybe you're from there. It's awesome. You won't get to vacation there a lot because you'll be working in your startup too much, but maybe you can retire there one day. Um, but that's, I think, the math that you should be thinking about in your head. Um, I do think that anyone who decides to not start their startup here should also be thinking, what can I extract from this place? Um, because the Bay Area has got an abundance of startup resources. So maybe you're not going to be here, but can you extract funding from here? Can you extract talent from here? Can you extract advice from here? You should be trying to steal as much as possible if you're not going to physically be here. All right, one more. Let me shut it down. Good. So uh, you had mentioned that all your founders typically are friends and from the same batch, etc. So uh, I have a unique situation where my co-founder is about 12 years uh, elder than me. And we have come are you friends? Uh, now we have after time. That's fine. So I, I would say this, right? Like, uh, once again, there's no perfect formula. 
What I would say though is that like, I do see some founders who create companies with strangers and who kind of make the argument, oh, this is like a talent and skill match, so I should make a company with a stranger. And what I see, unfortunately, often happens is when something really bad happens in the startup that makes it seem like the startup's not going to succeed, there isn't anything else holding the relationship between the two founders together. And so they can fight and they can break up. And the startup dies. And like one of the funny things that I've always seen about doing startups with my friends is that you know, when you're in those tough times, you don't want to quit because you don't want to let your friend down. Or when you're in this argument, you don't say that thing that's going to like that final thing that's going to get your friend to basically be like, fuck you, because it's your friend. And so like sometimes when all you're doing is skating by the skin of your teeth, like being there with your friend is the only thing that's getting you through. Um, so that's the pro of having friends. Some people do it without their friends, but that's why it's, uh, for me, it's always been easier to do with my friends. Okay, so thank you all so much. What I'll say is this. Thank you. My email is michael at ycombinator.com. I actually answer my emails. That's why I'm here, because they emailed me and I answered. Um, there was no special handshake or anything. Um, if you want to do a startup, I'm here to help, regardless of whether you do YC or not. I give my email to a lot of audiences like this, and only about 10% answer. And the only thing I'll tell you is that like, if you're doing a startup, you don't have to do it alone. And if you need help, you do have to be proactive about asking for it. Like if you're proactive about asking for help, the startup community will provide. If you're silent and quiet and you kind of think you have to do it by yourself, the startup community won't provide. So um, if now or in the future, you now know me, you now know someone at YC, you can email me anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, before, if you want to go to the left, we're going to take a group photo.